Welcome back everybody. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about new expressions. We're going to continue where we left off. Um, also really quick, if you guys hear any noise in the background, that's most likely my washing machine. So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, so let's go back to it. So where is it? So we're going to go back up to our primary expression and go down to new expression. So before we go to new expression, as mentioned before, we have to briefly talk about um, parsing a dot notation call expression. So this is that dot not that you've seen in some of these um, like go-to statements from the expressions we've already processed. Uh, so you can add that uh, so that way you can have that label and then just make sure you update all of the various um, you know if statements here that Retain that contain that um, specific go to statement. Um, and you guys can, of course, like when you go to this code here, you can check or do a file search for parse primary expression. It's in the parser file, and the parser file can be found in my front end parser and parser.c. So if you guys want to kind of just look through here to uh, get up to date as to where all the spots you need to update. Okay, so let's go down and see how we process a dot notation call expression. So the first thing you're going to want to do is, of course, create your dot not uh, label. After you do that, you want to enter protected mode. This is one of those situations where you need to enter protected mode, um, so make sure you do that. Of course, as usual, we store our old token or our current token. Um, that way we can reset it later if we need to. And after that, we parse our dot notation call expression. Now, we already know what this is. Um, I'm not really going to explain what this is. If you guys are curious about what a dot notation call expression is, I would recommend checking out my previous video that I made before this. I will put the link in the description below uh, so you guys can check that out. But in short, basically a dot notation call expression is something that allows us to access things like functions, fields, uh, arrays, and so on and so forth. So there's that. Um, so once you parse a dot notation call expression successfully, of course we want to fail if there were any errors processed because as you guys know, dot notation call expression can get really complicated really fast. So um, we definitely want to make sure we're covering for reporting any errors that we may have encountered. Then after you fail your errors um, or print any errors if there were any present, uh, you basically do this weird code here. Now, there's a reason why I do this. I'm pretty sure some of you guys are thinking, well, why am I doing this and why am I not just encapsulating the branch? Well, there's a reason for that. Um, if you guys remember here, I'm going to actually go to my compiler here. So if we go to my compiler and I search for parse or pile dot notation call. So if we go to dot notation call, we can see here like when you process a dot notation call expression, um, it's it's pretty complicated, right? So you know, like as you're processing your dot notation call expression, you can clearly have stuff after this. So you can have like an increment, a decrement. You could have a dot, another dot. You could have a left brace, or you could have an as. Now, generally, most of this stuff should be taken care of inside of this function here. Like you have left brace, increment, decrement. You have dot notation, uh, or you have dot. Uh, so I don't actually think you need this. This might have just been a copy paste. But if you notice, dot notation call expression is called in multiple places. So there's like dot not, dot not. Um, it's called in several other spots. And you don't want to, for this one specifically, I think I was doing some testing and you don't want to encapsulate it because what will happen is you'll break this on the compiler side, which is basically a post AST expression. Um, if you want it to basically compile a dot notation call expression, and if you remember what encapsulation does, it basically takes everything inside of this branch and stores it into the respective AST. So we just want to get the last AST, which is pertaining to dot notation call expression, and we want to uh, get that as our branch to store. We want to create our dot notation uh, call expression branch, which is the one we want to be inside of the of this actual AST here. Uh, we put the branch to store inside of this branch. I know this is like really confusing. And then we remove the branch minus two because since we added this dot notation branch to this AST, it's going to like, for instance, if we had like 
one AST here. Once we create this, we have two now. So we basically want to remove the AST behind this one. I know this is really weird, but I think that this was there was a legitimate reason for why I had to do that. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I know this one's kind of stupid. Uh, this is the only spot where I do this in the actual uh, expression parser. So yeah, that's why that's looking like that. Um, so after that, you have your as. So you want to check to see if the next token is equal to as if so or if it's not equal to as if so then oh i added a, another bug so here i'm going to do this get so you want to get the last sub ast and you want to reset the branch to whatever the last sub ast is um and as you guys remember as requires two asts it requires a left ast and a right ast so that's why we don't do it for as um but yeah so after that you have all this stuff so i'm well, I'm going to keep it. Um, this isn't really necessary because, like I said, all of this code, like increment, decrement, dot, and left brace, is processed inside of here. Um, this is completely unnecessary. You guys can delete it if you want. Um, I'm going to keep my code here as like a just-in-case, um, even though it's completely unnecessary. But yeah, so once we process our normal um, statements that we usually process after a successful uh, expression parsed, then we, of course, return true because we successfully processed everything. After that, uh, so if we did not process a dot notation call expression successfully, we want to ignore the errors by passing, reset the current token to whatever the old token was, and we free up the last sub because obviously this function created a sub AST. So there's that. Um, after that, so now let's kind of look into new expression. So this one's going to be a big one. This is going to be pretty much the bulk of this video. Uh, so this video is probably going to be a little bit longer. I just want to kind of get everything out in this one. So new expression, you guys know what that is. So if we look here, right, a new expression in programming languages basically denotes you want to create a new instance of a specific class. So here I'm going to go to primitives. So we have our primitives class, and we have all these various classes here, right? So these are the primitives that are represented in my programming language. We have u long long you int, int, you short, short, you char, so on and so forth. Um, and all these represent a integer of a certain uh, size, basically. So when we want to create our int class, we want to say new int of like six. So right, we create a new int of a number, and this represents our new instance. Now, there are several ways in my programming language to create uh, instances, and we'll see that here. So I'm going to go through the couple of ways that we have. So, of course, you have the standardized way of just creating a single instance. Now, let's say instead, um, and here, message is probably a bad name, um, num, here. So we have, like, our number, it's an int, and let's say this int class is, instead of it being a single class, let's say it's an array. Well, we would basically create an array of ints by saying new int um, array of six, or here, one, and that's how we would create a new array. So in our language, this is exactly just like Java. Uh, you create a new int array of one. Now, obviously in my language, you don't have to do that. You can just do that and it'll just figure it out. But um, to be explicit in telling the compiler, like I want to create a int array, this is how you would do it. Um, so you have this way. And then of course you can say one, two, three, so on and so forth. Um, or you could create another, you could do another way of saying new. You could say new int of, I don't know, 100, right? So you want to create 100 ints. So this basically creates a array of 100 ints. But when this array gets created, all of the values in this uh, int class will be null. It's not going to be zero because if you guys remember, this is an actual class. If it was a var, which represents a number in my language, then all of these values would be set to zero. But since this is a class which requires to have a object instance, they're all going to be null. There are several other ways of doing it as well. Let me see. Okay, so there's another way which is called um, dynamic class initialization. So here, this would help if I actually created a class. So let's say we create a class called, um, I don't know, A, because I'm, I don't know what to call it. Um, and let's say we have a variable called name of string. And let's say we have an ID value uh, representing an integer. And let's say we have one other final value of, let's say we say is processed. And let's say it's a Boolean, 
the Boolean class. So if we want to create this class, ordinarily what you would have to do in typical programming languages is you'd have to say class A, you'd have to create a constructor, and in that constructor you'd have to, um, you guys know what to do, like you'd have to put in your parameters representing the types of each of these fields and then you have to assign the fields inside of this uh, constructor. Now in my language I'm going to be offering several ways to mitigate that. I'm looking to add a feature which is called inline constructed declarations where you basically just say private um, or maybe public public name of type um, string and then you can also have like an ID of type int um, and is processed of type bool. So like you could do something like this and this would effectively be your constructor and you can like assign it default values or whatever you want to do in there. Um, I do not have that functionality yet so that's not going to be in this YouTube series for quite a while. Um, that'll probably be in a much later episode but for right now uh, let's just kind of show you how we do it now and I just wanted to kind of show you that because this is very important for later on when we're talking about how we initialize variables dynamically in our compiler on the back end side. It's pretty interesting how we do it, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But what you would do is you would use the feature that's called, that's already in the compiler, and we'll go over it um, as the YouTube series goes on, is inline class declaration. So what this is, is the difference between this, right? So if you did um, class A and you put the values in here, uh, that would effectively call this function and initialize the class inside of that function. But since we are using the inline uh, class declaration, that's going to basically create all of the code necessary to initialize this class inline. So it's not going to call a function, it's not going to do anything. Um, it's going to happen exactly where you write the new declaration. Um, so this comes with benefits of, I guess you could say, performance benefits. It's laughable. There's not really a performance benefit because you're just negating one function call. But yeah, so we can basically do like name is equal to John. Uh, we can also do uh, ID is equal to some ID. And then finally is processed is equal to uh, false. So let's say we have like, uh, here, here's probably a better name for it, user. So if we have like a user class, and we have a name, we have an ID, and then we have whether or not we process the user, this is how we create basically this inline initialization. And it's extremely fast if you don't want to have to go through the trouble of always having to create constructors if you just have a very simple class that holds very simple data. But there's another way, so you could do this as well. And what this basically does is this declaration here, uh, I don't have a name for it, um, but basically what it does is it looks at each field every time when you put a comma, that denotes I want to set another field, I want to set another field, I want to set another field. So the order at which you put the expressions must match the order of each field. So if you know your user class is always going to have a name, it's always going to be the first field, it's always going to have an ID as a second field, and it's always going to have a boolean which is called is processed at the third field then you can always just pass this same data in in the exact same order every time and you will effectively be assigning these fields without having to assign the names of them now you can't do things like um, i don't know say like id is equal to this and then not put the values for this and just tell the compiler to figure it out no that doesn't really um that's not possible that that adds a bunch of complexity um, and I didn't have enough time to actually figure out how to do that so you can't do that but yeah so there's basically two main ways you either have it with the names denoted before the expression or without the names denoted and just have expressions so let's go to look to see how everything is connected so the first thing you want to do is check to see if the next token is equal to new if so, we expect that token, and then we parse a naked U type. You guys know what that is, so I'm not going to go into that function. Um, after we parse our naked U type, then we have to basically process all the various different things that we just talked about, um, and then of course we process our after expression code as well. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is look at how do we process a array expression. 
Now, this is very important because there's two different types of array expressions. So if you guys remember, there is, like if we have the int, if we use the int example again, we have the int and we have basically an array of uh, 100 or 1000 for this example, or we have the example where we have um, this, where it's one, two, three. So if you notice, our compiler is processing an array in both instances. Uh, so how do we figure out exactly which one it is? Um, that's very important. I want you guys to know that. And I process these in a specific order because of that very reason. So the first thing I do is I check to see if the next token is equal to a left brace. If so, I parse what's called an array expression. Um, and it has to be in this order. So I process that by basically uh, creating a branch um, and letting that be called a AST array expression. Um, and if so, I or after I basically process that branch, um, I enter protected mode, store the current token, expect the left brace, and check to see if the next token is equal to a right brace. If the next token is not equal to a right brace, then I check to see if the next token is equal to a left curly. If so, I decrement the current token, pass the errors, and return false. And the reason why is because if we process this and the next token is not equal to a right brace, meaning that there has to be a number here, but if it is equal to a right brace, then what I do is I check to see if there is a left curly, um, immediately after this. So if we see that this is equal to a right brace, check to see if the next token is a left curly. That denotes that, oops, we made a mistake. We're not processing this expression where we just have the number. We are in fact processing this expression. Um, so that's very important. Uh, so I decrement the current token, pass the errors, fail. Um, otherwise, right, so if it's if it's equal to a left curly, then we just return false. It's totally fine. We'll process it in the next if statement. Um, otherwise, we actually complain. So we still return false, but we fail uh, to basically get out of the protected mode first and foremost. And there's not really an error to report because we haven't really processed anything. I mean, I guess maybe if this didn't work, um, we might get an error. But for the most part, we just fail so that way we can print this error here and say expected expression after left symbol. Because if you did something like this, that is not legal, uh, syntactically wise. That doesn't really make sense. You need to tell the compiler, you know, how big is the array. So if we do that, that's not allowed. So if we go back up to the top, we can see here now if it's not equal to a right brace, meaning that we have the number, then we basically try to parse an expression. So we say if we did not parse the expression successfully, then we basically reset the current token to the old value. Um, we ignore the errors that were generated as a result of parsing expression, because obviously this broke because it didn't return successfully. And then we check to see if, oh, okay, so this, this is actually bad code. We are actually going to free up this AST uh, at the higher level because if you remember, if we process this and it turns out to not be what we expected, uh, then we're just going to delete this entire AST, but we can't do it while we're inside of this branch. So what we're going to do is do it when we return out of this function. And I do not recommend trying to remove uh, ASTs from the AST that it was originally created at. That's just not a clean way of doing it. You want to return from this function and do it at the higher level. Um, so that's why I'm not going to say like AST dot remove last sub AST. Um, it's just not a clean way of doing it. It would work, but yeah, uh, personal preference. But after that, you return false. Um, otherwise, if you successfully parse the expression, then you fail, uh, obviously, because you want to make sure if there were any errors reported in between, uh, you want to report those errors. And then uh, you basically check to see this code here. So we already went over this code. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much everything. Uh, so you have the case where if it looks like we're processing what we think we are, and we do whatever we need to do, otherwise we take evasive action. Um, after that, you want to expect a right brace, and then of course you want to return true. So regardless, like if you get down to here, you want to return true, because the only way you'll get down here is if, I mean, you successfully parse an expression. So yeah. Um, that's how that works. Now let's go back to our um, new expression and see how we remove this AST. So if we did not successfully process this, right, 
then we need to do the next check. So we need to check to see if the next token is a left brace again. And of course, it will be true because we reset the current token to its previous value before we advanced and like messed up the state of what the current token was. So if that's the case, then we free the last sub because uh, the sub AST was created as a result of this. And any sub ASTs inside of this will also be deleted. So like the expression that we create will be deleted. Any tokens we add will also be removed. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, after that, we expect the left brace and the right brace, and then we parse what's called a vector array. Uh, and vector array is the technical term for um, basically dynamic arrays in my programming language. So a vector array represents uh, these two curly braces and like just a series of expressions in there. And it can represent either a vector array explicitly attached to a new expression or just a vector array with a bunch of random things inside of it. Um, so we'll see this being used in other spots as well. So let's look to see what a vector array is. So it's fairly simple. Um, you just basically get a branch of AST vector array. Uh, you expect the left curly. And you check to see if the next token is uh, not equal to a right curly. Now I will note here that it's perfectly legal for you to do this. So like if you say new int array of nothing, well, I mean, personally, this isn't really like, why would you do this? It, basically, all this is going to turn into when the compiler looks at this is that. Like, that's basically what the compiler is going to turn this code into. But it's totally legal for you to do that. Um, you can complain about it if you want. Um, personally, I didn't see it as a big deal. But I check the next token, see if it's a right curly, parse an expression. Uh, I check to see if the next token is a comma. If so, expect the comma, expect or parse an expression. Go back up to the top, rinse and repeat. Um, this is just like almost every other looping function that I have in my parser. So it's pretty much the same thing. After that, we expect the right curly. Um, and then we can go back. So that's vector array. Fairly simple uh, function. So here we are. All right. So if we processed both of these and maybe it's neither of these um and the and you don't have to worry about like the case where well what if this created a uh, ast well i mean it's not really going to do that because it's it's only going to get into here if it's a left brace and nothing else checks for left brace um so if this failed it will delete this ast and create a new one and then just return uh true down here Otherwise, if this happened to be true, then it'll uh, create this AST and then return true down here. So you don't have to worry about like um, any weird stuff happening with unnecessary ASTs being generated. So if we look at the case where we have our um, new expression and we create a, uh, or we call basically the constructor for the class and we you know pass in our parameters, um, or actually it would just be one parameter in this case, uh, we basically do that by checking to see if the next token is a left paren, and we just basically parse an expression list. Now we've gone over this function before, um, and I mean I remember like it has this begin jar and end jar. This is exactly why we needed uh, to pass that into parsing our expression list because this function is being used in multiple spots. So it's literally just a loop of a bunch of expressions, very similar to the way we do everything else. Um, in our parser, you just kind of expect the first character, check to see if the, the end, uh, like the end character is not equal to the next one. If so, run the loop and, you know, do that at the end. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, so we've gone over that already. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you are expecting for our tokens, a left print and a right print. So after that one, um, we have a left curly. Now this one is for the instance where we have this. So we have like our name is equal to um, John. We have our ID, comma, ID is equal to whatever, and is processed is equal to false. Um, and of course, we'll get into the logistics. Like there are certain rules, like for instance, um, we'll see it on the back end, but um, here, I'm gonna do like true. So like, let's say every user is processed 
to processed as true by default because let's say I don't know maybe the assumption is that when we're creating this user object the user is technically processed because we have generated an ID for them or something and whatever program we have um, so in this case we don't have to set pro uh, is processed to true um, in our back end we can just like do that right so at the parser level the parser has no concept or idea of logistics in terms of like syntactically you're not required to write all of these fields because the parser doesn't know what fields this user class is. The parser doesn't even know what a class is, period. So um, we'll have to create those rules on the back end side. But it is important, um, and I would recommend as you're building your programming language, do not wait, please, I'm begging you, do not wait until the end of your parser to then start creating rules for your programming language. That's a very bad idea, and I've made that mistake before. I would recommend like as you're building your syntax, you don't need to create like all of the rules or you don't need to have like everything figured out, but I would just recommend try to figure out what your language is gonna be doing. Even at a high level, it doesn't even have to be concrete, just like figure out what the fuck you're doing. So after that, you want to basically peek two tokens and see, so like if we check the next character and it's a left curly, then you wanna check uh, the character after this left curly to see if it's an identifier and that's important because if you guys remember we have two formats we have the format where we have the identifier the equal sign and then the expression or we have just straight expressions and the reason why you can clearly see it here if we have an identifier after the left curly and it checks it, it bases off the first one so basically if you do this right our compiler is going to expect that it's supposed to be expressions all the way through. If you do this, and then you do this, our compiler is going to be expecting names all the way through with in conjunction with um, the expression value. So it depends on the first one, and if the user screws up, obviously you'll get a syntax error. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's kind of how it works on the language side. It, it's a lot easier for me to just do it this way instead of like trying to be a smart ass about it and like try to figure out what the user's trying to do. Um, so I basically check that and if, so let's look at the case where it's not an identifier. This is very simple. We literally just call parse expression list again and we set the begin and end chars to the curly braces. Um, so if the case where it is an identifier, um, we want to do a couple of things. So we want to check to see if the identifier is equal to base, so like if we check, um, so basically what our compiler is going to do is we're going to say int, uh, we're going to check this, all right, we're good, now we're checking this. If we check to see if this is an identifier, we also want to check to see if that same token is equal to base. We do that because we need to like basically, like, because when you think about it, right, you can't just assume that like the thing after the brace, like if it's an identifier, oh, it's 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 this format. No, that isn't that doesn't prove that. Because what if you have like I don't know, um, let's say user name, right? Let's say we have like an identifier called username, and we're assigning that to the user class, um, and it's an identifier. Well, I mean that's perfectly valid. Like what if this is like in a function somewhere and we have a username variable that was created somewhere in a higher scope and we're passing that in as a value. Well, that's clearly an expression that's obviously not a, um, you know, that's obviously not a, this format where you have like the ID and the equals. Also, what if you have um, like something like get username and like, let's say it's like a function, get username, and then we say like dot, um, I don't know, um, name or something. I don't know, like get username dot name, whatever. Like we just have some function here. Well, the first character is again, a identifier. So you wanna check if this is an identifier, you wanna be sure that the next token after that is an equal sign. And if that is the case, then that means that you can then um, assume that it's this formatting. Now, if you have an expression that has an equal sign in it, I can't help you. Like, the only way to get around that is to, like, do this. We have, like, a parentheses. Um, and then, like, if you have an expression where you're, I don't know, assigning some value to something else from some other value, and maybe, like, this calls a function, like an operator overload or something, 
then just use parentheses so that's your workaround. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we just kind of assume that. So lots of things you have to think about when you're doing this. It's not like super easy. Um, so we check to see if the next token is equal to base or if it's equal to equals, uh, if, the, if the token after it. So, okay, so this is important. So if we check the first character, is a left curly the next character is an identifier the character after the identifier is an equal sign or the character after the left curly is a base then we parse call we call uh, parse field on that list otherwise we uh, give up and we just say well it must be an expression list uh, so we don't have to go over parse expression list because we've already seen that before so let's go into parsing a field init list so this is now we're in the formatting portion of it so we create an AST called AST field init list. We expect our left curly and we check to see if our right curly is not equal to that. So in our language, again, this is perfectly legal. Like you don't have to, like if you want to just initialize the class and everything can be null, well, that's perfectly fine. Now, again, if you remember, this goes back to creating rules. Even though I'm not processing anything here, the is uh, processed Boolean will actually be set to true. Because what you want to do is you want to initialize all default values to whatever they need to be. Um, now, if I did something like is processed equal to false, what that's going to do is on the back end, that's going to override the default value of is processed, and it's just going to set it to false. And we won't, it won't be like a situation where I set it to false, and then I like override that value by setting it to true um, or weird stuff like that. So um, you know, again, more stuff you got to think about on the back end. That's why it's super important to think about this stuff beforehand. So this is perfectly legal. So that's why we allow that. Um, then what we do is we parse what's called a field initialization. Um, now, before we get into that, let's just look at the high level. Uh, this is the same crap that we see all the time. We just check to see if there's a comma, expect the comma. We check to see if there's a field initialization. Um, and I have an error here. Okay. So I guess at the high level, what I do is I like if we expect a comma and we're expecting to parse a field initialization, if it doesn't process successfully, then we want to error out um, because obviously we require that. Um, personally, I would recommend you just kind of put that in this function here. Don't really know why I have it outside of the function, but hey, it works. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so if it's not successful, then we say basically expected field initializer. Otherwise, we just go back up to the top, rinse and repeat. Um, and of course, we close out this function by expecting a closing bracket or a closing curly. So let's see what field initialization looks like. So we create a AST field init. Uh, now here's, here's the important part, right? So you saw where I checked to see if it was base. Um, now, this is very tricky, right? So here, I'm going to give you guys a weird like situation. So like, let's say we have like, and the reason why you want to do base is because like, let's say this user class, um, I don't know, has a base class of account, right? So let's say account, and let's say we have this class here, class account, and I don't know, let's say it has like a um, account number or something, right? And it's a string. So we have this string class and it's an account number. Uh, you want to say like base, what the fuck? okay, base, and you want to say number. Now, if you guys remember, like, what if I have two fields called number in each class? Well, then you can just say base at um, account. All this functionality is baked into this uh, syntax. Um, so you can say base at account, or in this case, since there isn't duplicate field names, we just say base number. Um, I mean, this is unnecessary. You can just say number, but I'm just doing it to like show you guys how it works. I uh, would say number is equal to um, one, two, three dash, you know, some random value, right? So this could represent the account number. Now, the reason why you want to have this base here is what if they want to access a base field? Um, because that, I mean, that's legal. It's this is not recommended for this functionality. This goes against. Um, the design standards like you shouldn't be doing this uh, this is bad but i still have to allow the user to do it so that's why we want to do it now again you have the situation where what if you say like um base dot get um username i know this is kind of stupid but like 
what if we have like a base dot get username or something and we we're calling a function um, to do a thing right uh, it, it's really difficult to know um, so in this case we'll just assume that it has to be the format of you know base and then number and then equals if again if the user wants to get around that all they have to do is just surround it in parentheses and that will classify this as an expression instead of classifying it as you know a, a field assignment um, but yeah so we basically have our um, we check to see if our next token is base we expect the base we parse the base class u type you guys know what that is we've already gone over this before so I don't have to talk about it um, we expect the pointer symbol and then we process what we need so we basically parse a u type naked we check to see if the next token is equal to equals, and we uh, expect the equals, and we expect the expression. Now, this is where we return false, right? So if the next token is not equal to equals, then we just return false uh, because, I mean, th this qualifies as an expression if equals is not the next token. So um, that's that's why we do that. But yeah, so that is field init list. Um, and that's how we basically process all of those different forms of new expression or new classes. So let's see what happens. So if we processed everything, right? If we've processed a left brace, it's not an array. It's not a like a dynamic array creation. It's not a static uh, array initialization. Um, it's not a dynamic or it's not an inline class initialization or calling a class constructor. Then we give up and we just say expected uh, left brace, expected left paren, or left curly after new expression. It has to be one of those, obviously, because we expect uh, to process that information. After we do all of that, then we want to expect or we want to encapsulate um, our new expression. And that's how we can encapsulate it into this. And we do our normal stuff. So we check to see if. Uh, the next token is equal to or is not equal to as as usual if it's not equal to as we want to good god I do this everywhere we want to get the last sub AST um, and assign that to branch to reset it and if it's not equal to as then we want to add support for increment decrement dot now we don't want to add support for left brace and here's why right like what okay here, I'm going to do this. Uh, so let's say we create like a new int of 9, right? What, what is going on? Okay, so if we, if we create like a new int of 9, uh, so we have basically a, an array of 9 values. It does not make sense to say add 0. First of all, I don't uh, allow for array arrays in my programming language. I don't, I can process that at the low level, but I don't have the ability to process that at the high level yet that's something I'm still working through maybe that's going to be in a later video on how to do that but what this would allow or denote to the user is this would basically show the user that they're creating a two-dimensional array which which is currently not possible so that's one reason another reason is why would you want to do that like if you create like a new array right and you say one comma two comma three it's just bad syntax to then say at index of nine. Like you're literally going to create an array, waste all of this memory, like creating all these values, and then you're just gonna return one value. Why don't you just return like, if you're gonna, so like for instance, if we say like um, one, right? We wanna turn the first index, which means return number two. Why don't you just say two, right? Obviously like that's a lot more efficient. So. We don't want the user doing that, so that's why I'm saying unexpected symbol uh, left brace. Um, and of course, if we have as, we go to our as expression. And finally, we return true. So let's look to see how all of this is tied together. So I'm going to go here, new int, and I'm going to do 100 first. So we can check that. I'm also going to do a fine parse variable declaration. Make sure our breakpoint is there. Good, excellent. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of some of this noise and we can see what our compiler actually generated. Okie dokie, so why is this not working? All right, so if we look up here, we can go to our new syntax. Um, 
here. I'm actually going to get rid of this. There's a ton of noise. Here, let me redo this. So, if we go back, um, I removed some of the noise. All right, so we have a new expression. So we have our primary expression, um, AST new expression. We have our new symbol um, or our new token here. We have a U type of int. Uh, so that's going to be the first AST. So it's going to be two ASTs and a new expression uh, of this type of a new expression. Um, so first we're going to have the type, uh, which is going to be int. And then we're going to have the array expression. Um, of course, you have your two um, tokens here, but these tokens aren't really necessary. You can like omit those if you want. We have our expression, primary expression. It's a literal of 100, and that's it. So that one is not too bad uh, in terms of complexity. So let's step it up a little bit and see how this one looks. So I'm going to create. First, I'm going to just do an empty one. Let's see how an empty one looks, because this is, again, perfectly legal to do that. Um, so, oh wow, this one's actually really short. So we have a primary expression of a new expression of a u-type of int, of course, because we need to know what type it is. And then we have our vector array of nothing. So I actually didn't expect this one to be that short. So that's interesting. Well, let's say one, two, three. Go back. All right. So. If we go back up to the top, oh, this one's much bigger. All right, so we have our primary expression, new expression. Uh, we have our U-type, as usual. Then we have our vector array. Um, and our vector array is going to have all of these various tokens here. Again, not necessary. You can omit those. And we have, here's what's important. We have three ASTs. So it looks like everything was created successfully. So we have three. It should be a literal, literal, literal. Um, so they're all literals. That's good. So now let's look at the next formatting. So let's say we have our user class. Now we don't actually need to have a class here to um, see how things look. So I'm going to create just a blank user class um, and go back. So if I create a blank user class, we have a primary expression of a new expression. We have our U type of user, so now our U type has changed, very good. And we have an expression list of this. So, yeah, this one is going to be empty, so now let's actually add some code. So, if I remember correctly, it was name, ID, and then finally is processed. So, if we do something like that, you can just see basically an expression list here with um, various expressions attached to them. So, we have our primary expression of new. Uh, we have our U type as usual of user. We have an expression list of three values. So let's see. So we have a literal. Uh, it looks like it's a string, which is correct. Uh, we have another literal of uh, a number, which is correct. And then we have a final literal of true. Um, very good. So now let's actually put the names here. So if I say name is equal to this, ID is equal to that and is processed is equal to that, we should see now the field init list, which I showed you guys earlier. All right, so going back up to the top, uh, new expression, U type of user. Whoops, what did I just do? Okay, uh, so we have our U type of user, uh, field init list, and we have three ASTs, so that's good. Um, so we have our first field list, we have our equal sign, um, I don't think you need that, um, but I, you can probably leave it if you want. Um, so we have our U type of name, that's very important, and then we have our AST expression. Also guys, you want this to be a U type, you, you do not want this to just be like a lone literal, just floating in the distance. Right, it's very important for this to be a U type, uh, whatever the uh, variable name is, because I have some really cool tricks up my sleeve for later on in the YouTube series where I basically created in my compiler ways to force and trick the compiler into thinking something is happening when it actually isn't. And it's a very powerful and awesome feature uh, for me to basically make the compiler do things that. Um, instead of like creating all these various functions to like to accommodate for all the various different things that I want to do, I just basically figured out a way to say, hey, compiler, I want you to do this, this, and this, and it just does it automatically. So 
Um, just make sure, like, there's a method to my madness for all of these things that I'm doing. Even if some of the stuff that I'm showing you guys seems a bit silly, you'll see that it's pretty cool uh, when we get into the back end later on. But after that, we have our expression. So we have our expression for the first one. Looks like it's a literal. That's good. Um, then we have our filled init list, our second one for ID. So we have our U type of ID. That's good. We have our expression of our literal 1, 3, blah, 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 or 1, 9, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's good. And finally, we have our filled init list of is processed with a literal of true. So that looks to be everything for parsing new expressions. I know this one was quite a long video, so thanks for you guys who sticked around to watch the full video. Um, definitely appreciate it. As usual, if you guys have any questions, definitely put them in the comment section below. Um, but yeah, so you guys have pretty much learned everything on how to parse new expressions. After this, we're going to get into parsing lambda functions, which is going to be really fun. So definitely look out for that video. That video is going to be on uh, Thursday. So that's going to be in a couple, or Friday, sorry. Uh, so that's going to be on the first. Um, yeah. As per usual, if you guys would love to help support the channel, definitely head over to my GitHub repository at androidevcd slash sharp. And when you guys get over there, definitely watch, star, and fork the repository. I was going to give this language a lot more visibility and let other developers know this language exists. Also, if you guys are interested in maybe looking at what I do on a daily basis in terms of like updates and stuff, you can definitely head over to the remastered branch. Pretty much anything besides master and remastered are not used, so keep that in mind. And when you get over there, you can check out my commits. Um, I write some pretty wordy commits, so you guys can kind of see uh, or get a gist of kind of what I've been doing so far in terms of like improving the language and doing bug fixes and just kind of pushing the code along. I recently just did a pretty humongous update and I'm in the home stretch, guys. Like, I'm getting really close to being done with the compiler. And I didn't think that I'd be able to say that so early. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. So, so that's pretty awesome. Also, if you guys are interested in maybe learning things that I've done in the past or maybe are interested in, like, finding out stuff that I'm looking to add to the language in the future, I'd recommend heading over to the docs folder. Uh, and there you can look at, there's mainly two files that you want to look for. Uh, there's the changeless file that's going to contain pretty much everything that I've done to the language in the past as far as like updates, bug fixes, so on and so forth. Um, and then the roadmap file is going to contain pretty much everything that I've done to the language thus far, as well as things that I'm looking to add in the future. So that's going to be it for today, guys. Definitely like, comment, and subscribe if you guys like what you saw and you want to see more. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.